if you've got a, a Bible there, that's... Oh, there's no kids' church, is there today? No, okay, great. Well, not great for the kids, you've got to sit through this, but, you know, great for the, for, for the fact that we can move on. Um, hey, if you've got a Bible there, can you turn with me to uh, Romans chapter 8 at the moment? Romans chapter 8. Um, hey, I, 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 I come across a story this week. Oh, no. A father, a father had won a toy at an office game. He called his three kids together to ask which one, which one should have the present. Who's the most obedient, he asked them. The children all stared back at him in silence. Then he asked, who never talks back to their mother? Again, the kids appeared to be mystified by the question, so the father asked again, who does everything she says? With that question, the kids were finally able to come to some conclusion. Three voices together said, okay, Dad, you get to keep the toy. <laughs> Hey, I was with YWAM um, this week up in Brisbane and um, spent a bit of time with some uh, fellows there that had just uh, finished a six-month training course. They'd done three months in lectures and gone overseas to uh, Vietnam and Japan, uh, Solomon Islands on an outreach, and they came back. And uh, part of uh, the reason why they got me up there was to spend three days with them and to talk to them about the transition from being on that mountaintop experience of six months in a Christian community and, and all the love and the grace and the excitement and e energy and, and, and time that you have just to devote to God. You're going to go from that back to uh, home and maybe back to university and, and, and you know, your neighbour in the bed next to you might not be so gracious with your clothes on the floor because you know, it's why when we're all nice to each other. Mum and Dad might say, get back in that room, pick up your clothes. There's going to be a whole lot of changes, transitions and things that are going to take place in their life. So I go and spend a few days with them and just sort of talk them through some of those transitions. On one of the days, we focus on the transition from why we went back into the context of their local church and what that is like. And one of the points I make with them is when you go back to your church, you're blessed to be a blessing. Who believes that? We're blessed to be a blessing. I mean, God blesses us with stuff. There's a flow-on effect. God, it, God doesn't say you're blessed full stop. Hoard it up. It's all about you and that's the end of it, you know. He says you're blessed, comma, to be a blessing. There's a flow on. God wants to get things to us to get them through us. I'm talking resource. I'm talking time he gives us. I'm talking revelation he gives us. Uh, the, the healing, the things he does in my life. He wants me to turn that around and pay it forward, so to speak, and be a blessing to the world around me as well. So I said to them, when you go back to your church, here's what I want you to do. Go back and, and adopt the posture of a servant, not a judge. So don't go back to your church and be a judge. Because when you have an experience like you do in YWAM, uh, where every day is prayer day, uh, every minute is in the Word of God, uh, uh, you've got different speakers coming through every week. There's a level of excitement that happens with a new speaker and the different types of gifts that they have and, and what they bring. Uh, there's, there's, there's worship going on whenever you feel like it all the time. Uh, if you actually hurt someone, uh, you know, they'll apologise and they'll forgive you and, and rarely are they great. You know? It's just a wonderful, wonderful environment. And when a lot of people come back to the local churches, they can be quite critical of the local church. But there's a big difference between a mission organisation such as Why Women a Local Church in so many areas. But one of the things I, I, I say to them is to go back as a servant, not a judge. Now, one of the young ladies there who was from uh, Finland asked me this question. She said, but what if I see people doing the wrong thing? Is it okay to point that out to them? I thought, wow, that's... And, and we spent about the next hour just unpacking that question. Okay, let's, let's have a look at that. And what I realised as we unpacked that and chatted with them, and I threw a few scenarios at them and so on, what I realised was this, that, that we really want a faith that's linear, don't we? We want a clean, packaged, nice, linear type of faith. The word linear in the dictionary means arranged uh, in or extending along a straight or nearly straight line, something that's nice, neat and sequential. And we want or we would love to have a faith that is neat and sequential and packaged and tidy and easy to follow and you can rubber stamp it over here and take it from there and go, what it looks like here, it's going to look exactly like over there, and, and what faith looks like in your life, Leslie, and the way God moves in your life, and what, what you're being convicted of, or what's right or what's wrong or whatever. You, you take that and we'll just put that on you, Marie, the same one. We'll take it off you, put it on you, Di, take it off, put it on you, Jackie. And it would just be like this cookie-cutter stream of this being or creature called a Christian. But how many of you know our faith is not necessarily linear like that i wish that everything about god was black and white who would like that who likes black and white hands up if you're a black and white person 
Half of you like black and white, the other of you are not quite sure. Um, but, but, but black and white is easier to live with than grey. Amen? Knowing, no, but so, t- telling somebody that, that one of the temptations with parents when your kids are growing up is, is as they get older, we want to continue to tell them right and wrong without ever really asking them, why don't you engage with it? What do you think? What do you think? They have a problem. They come to us. We just give them the answer this, without going, well, gee, you've got a bit of a problem. What are you going to do about that? And causing them to think a little bit about it. Life is, is a lot easier. It feels a lot easier when it's linear and black and white and straight down the line. But Christianity was never meant to be about following a black and white rule book. It was meant to be about walking daily in a relationship with God. It's meant to be about walking daily with the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 8, verse 14 and the guy writing this is a guy called Paul. Paul was, if you go and read about, about uh, Paul, his previous name was Saul. He was very anti-church. He hated Christianity. He was so passionately against this illegal movement called the Way that he had letters from the rulers and the priests and that to go around and to throw in prison anybody. The dead believed that this Jesus character was crucified, buried, and resurrected. The crucified, buried bit, no worries. Everybody knew that. But to dare say that he was resurrected and keep this story going, they were going to crush this thing called Christianity. Apparently, they did a very poor job. Amen? They did a very poor job. But he writes this. He says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. As many as are led by the Spirit. That word led in the, in the Greek language, it, it has a present tense continuous sense. So it literally means for as many as are being regularly led. Being regularly led. You, you know what? I believe everybody in this room, at least once in our life, you were led by the Holy Spirit. You know why I know that? Because if you gave your life to Jesus, you came to a point of conviction, bowed your knees, surrendered your life to that, it was the Spirit of God that led you to that point. The devil wasn't pushing you towards that. And your natural flesh wasn't pushing you towards that. My flesh doesn't want to kill itself. Amen? So I don't put to death the deeds of my flesh by my own flesh. It's countercultural. My flesh is going, no, no, leave me alone. I want to live. I want to live. But God's saying, we've got to put to death certain things about you. So if you're in this room, we, we've been led by the Spirit at least once. And that was to get us to that point to surrender and give our life over to Jesus. But what Paul's saying here, he's saying that, that the sons of God, those who are the sons and daughters of God, they are the people that have learnt to be continually led by the Spirit. It's not a one-off thing. And I wonder for many people in the Christian faith, how many of us were, we were led by the Spirit without even realising it. We were led by the Spirit to come to the cross, to surrender ourselves. But then once we came to the cross and surrendered, we then decided to pick up a rule book and start living by a rule book. Now it becomes about the rules, the do's and the don'ts and what I can and what I can't. I'm not anti the rule book. I, it's, not even, it's not a rule book. Jesus in, in uh, I'm trying to remember where it is, Jesus was confronted by some religious leaders one day, Mark 5, somewhere around there. And he accused them. These guys knew the Bible back to front. And he said this to them. He said, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. But this is they that speak of me. In other words, everything in here is not pointing to rules, do's and don'ts. It's ultimately pointing to Jesus. But he says, but you won't come to me that you might have life. You're following all the rules. You're dotting every I and you're crossing every T. But, but, but Jesus referred to them ultimately as broods of vipers and hypocrites and so on, even though they knew it all and, and probably obeyed the rules and tried to, you know. But Jesus said, you're a brood of vipers and you're hypocrites. There's no life in you. And Paul's saying here that those who are continuously led by the Spirit, they're the sons and children of God. We didn't get saved so that we could then dive into a rule book and spend all our time trying to compare ourselves to this. Am I good? Am I bad? Am I being naughty? Am I being nice? What's going on? But yet it's amazing how many people live their Christian experience that way. Now, let me be very clear. I'm not anti the Word of God. And I'll I'll, I'll preface by saying I do not believe the Holy Spirit is ever going to lead me away from what's in here. So let me just clear that one up straight away. But I believe when I wake up in the morning that I have this thing inside of me called the Holy Spirit. Who believes that? The Holy Spirit of God is with me. The Holy Spirit is with me when I wake up in the morning. He's with me when I stub my toe. You know, sometimes when we, we come into church and, you know, we'll, we'll sometimes pray and we'll sometimes someone will pray, well, Lord, we just pray when they, that, 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 you know, when they come here, they would experience it. And we want you to experience it here, but at the same time, we acknowledge the Spirit was with you when you opened your eyes. He was with you when you went to the toilet this morning. 
He was with you when you made your breakfast. He was with you when you made that cup of coffee or didn't make that cup of coffee. Rod, for your wife this morning. Just give him a nudge. The Spirit of God is with us. See, God's children are marked by their capacity to be led by the Spirit. This is actually the key to entering into the life of the New Testament believer. The New Testament believer is, is entering into and walking in the Holy Spirit, walking daily in a relationship with God's Spirit. This is what Jesus uh, alluded to when he said to his disciples, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm physically here with you now and I'm going to go. But I want you to know that, that when I go, because you can imagine, can you imagine being a disciple and having Jesus in the flesh walking with you? And then he says to you, the party's about to end and I'm going to go. I would be flat as a tack. You know, I remember as a child visiting my cousin and we'd play for a couple of days and then I'd get in the car and drive home and all of a sudden I was separated from the presence of my little cousin and I could go into a downward depressive spin for two weeks. The world's going to end, life's never going to be the same again. You know, this is Jesus. They're walking three years with the one that we worship this morning. They're walking with him. And he says, I'm going to go. But Jesus says, I want you to understand something. When I go, I'm just giving you a heads up. I'm not going to leave you as an orphan. You're not going to be alone. You're not going to be alone. I won't physically be here bodily. I'm going to die, be, be crucified. I'm going to be buried. I'm going to raise from the dead. When I raise from the dead, I'm going to raise back in a physical body. Jesus is still physically in a body, if we want to put it that way. The Bible tells us that he's seated at the right hand of the Father. You can go into the New Testament and you won't hear stories or scripture references that talk about Jesus being down here, still walking amongst us. Although I do believe you hear of stories of people having visions of Jesus and so on. I know it happens. But, but, but Jesus has still got that body there and he's resurrected and he showed, he showed the disciples and those people the nail holes and all that stuff. And you'll find over 50 to 100 references in the New Testament that tell you Jesus is now seated at the right hand of the Father. But the Holy Spirit... The one that he said, I'm going to send to you because I'm not going to leave you as an orphan. You don't, in other words, you don't have to do this thing alone. You don't have to do this thing alone. This Christian life is not something that you are going to be capable of doing by yourself. Well, hang on a second, you don't know me. I'm pretty good. I know a couple of Bible verses, you know. I don't struggle with sin. Well, I don't struggle with bad sins, you know. Well, Jesus said you can't do it on your own. You can't do it by yourself. I was rereading Acts. I've been going through the book of Acts recently and just looking at it again. And here's what I've come to discover that I can't escape. In the Old Testament, it almost, and I'm not being blasphemous here because I believe in one God, in, in triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God. But here's what I find when I read this collection of ancient documents that we call the Bible. The Old Testament, the Father seems to be central to the whole narrative. It's like God the Father is leading, guiding. They almost have this picture of him with the big, with the big picture plan out in front of him. And, okay, so at this point, I'm going to um, you know, give Israel a king. At this point, uh, they're going to they're split. But at this point here, I'm going to bring Jesus comes in at this point here, the cross. We're going to send the Spirit here, and we're going to begin this church age. Uh, well, I'll come back over here somewhere is when I'll return, consummate the ages, and so on. Uh, and, and so the Old Testament, we've got this, this picture of the Father being central. In the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, who's the central character? It's Jesus, isn't it? Jesus is central to the Gospel age. The, the, the writers write about Jesus. He's the focus. He, he's the whole point there. As we move on from the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus into the church age, the book of Acts, the document of Acts that Luke writes, the first 30 years of church history, the Holy Spirit all of a sudden becomes the central Godhead character in the narrative. It's the Holy Spirit that we see uh, interacting. It's the Holy Spirit that we see setting people apart. It's the Holy Spirit we see speaking. It's the Holy Spirit we see guiding. It's the Holy Spirit we see stopping. In, in the New Testament age, it's the Holy Spirit. In John 20, verse 17, Jesus has this encounter. He's just been resurrected. And I think it's Mary comes and she's, she's, as you can imagine, he's been crucified, resurrected, and she sees Jesus. There's Jesus. And she grabs him. She grabs him. I'm not going to let you go again. They took you. They crucified you. I thought I'd never see you. I'm not going to let you go. And Jesus says this. He says, do not cling to me. In, in the Greek, it literally means don't touch me. Don't touch me. Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. In other words, don't hang on to me, because I've got to go, because something's going to happen. Don't hang on to me. It's not going to be all me now. Oh, I'm not going to physically be with you. You're hanging on to me now, and you don't want to let go of me. You're clinging to me, because you know that when you let go before the Romans, and I was gone, and you didn't see me for three days, and I was oh, here, oh, I'm not going to let you go this time. Have you ever lost a child? Anyone ever lost a child in a, in, in a crowd or something? 
right? Yep. And then you find that child. And you grab that child and you wrap your arms around that child and you say, I'll never take my eyes off you again. I'll never let you go. I can imagine it being the same kind of emotion here for Mary. I'm not letting go. But Jesus says, no, you've got to let go. Don't cling to me. I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I'm ascending to my father and to your father and to my God and to your God. And in John 16, 7, here's what Jesus had told them already. He said, nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away. In other words, it's better. It's going to be way better for you if I get out of here. It's going to be way better for you. He says, because it's to your advantage that I go away. If I don't go away, here's the thing, if I don't make it up there, then I can't tag team him and he won't come down. You ever seen tag the wrestling? You know, you can't get to, you've got to get to the edge and, you know, you know it, I went on, who thought wrestling was real when they were a kid, just quietly? Any of you older generation? Yeah, so did I. <laughs> it's not. Um, so anyway, you, you know, they're, they're straining and they've they got a tag team and then when you tag team, it's like one jumps out of the ring and the other one jumps in. They're still the same team, but they're playing different roles in that moment. It's like the role of the Father in the Old Testament, the role of Jesus in the Gospels. Now the tag has been passed on and the Holy Spirit jumps in the ring in the church age. It's the same kind of imagery. It's the one team. But now it's tag and now the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says, if I don't go, he won't come. So you've got to let go of me, Mary, because I'm going to go, because it's so important that I go, because if I don't go, he won't come. But if I depart, I will send him to you. I will send him to you. So the Holy Spirit is central to the New Testament church age. The Holy Spirit is central to the life of a New Testament believer. Personalize it, the Holy Spirit is essential, is essential to your Christian walk. The Holy Spirit is essential to you living the Christian life. The Holy Spirit is essential to you discovering your giftings and moving in those things. The Holy Spirit is essential to you discovering Christian community. The Holy Spirit is essential for you to become the person God intended and created you to be in the first place. And we've all been messed up along the way and we're all on a journey to try to find that person again and come back into that space. We can't do the Christian life without the empowerment of the Spirit. And we were actually never meant to do it. In Luke 24... Verse 49, Jesus, uh, Luke records uh, Jesus saying this to his disciples after being resurrected. He says, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. They understood the promise to be the... The promise was the Holy Spirit, exactly. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but wait in the city of Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. I love this picture. Jesus is resurrected, he's gone, but it's almost like he says to them, uh, and that word wait literally means sit or sit down. Nearly every other time that word is translated in the, in the New Testament, it's translated as the word sit or sit down. In other words, don't do nothing until you get the Spirit. Don't do nothing until the Spirit comes upon you. And, and, and if, you, if Jesus says don't do anything, Without the Holy Spirit, he's probably in one sense trying to say, if you get up and try to do this Christian stuff before you're empowered, you'll probably mess it up. I don't want you running around trying to do things for me. And, and, and consequently, I wonder whether they did mess it up. Remember they cast lots? Remember, they, there's a, there's a, remember Peter stands up and goes, well, the, um, Judas who hung himself and, and the scripture says, let another one take his place. Well, instead of letting another one take his place, they decided to give his place to somebody else, drew lots to a guy called Matthias. Matthias. And you never hear about Matthias again throughout the whole Bible. I wonder whether had they waited, who do you think might have been the one that might have come and taken his place? He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. His name's Paul. Maybe. I don't know. But it's almost like Jesus is saying, you need to wait because you need the Spirit. The Spirit is essential to living out and walking in this Christian life. Now, the Spirit's here now, so we don't have to wait anymore. We don't have to wait. If you're born again in this place, if you surrendered your life to Jesus, according to Peter's preaching back in Acts chapter 2, then when you gave your life to Jesus, the promise of the Spirit was given to you. And the Holy Spirit came and entered your life. If you're a believer here, that's what I believe the Scriptures say. Even if you don't speak in tongues. You can yell at me later on for that if you want to. And I'll take you to this collection of ancient documents and I'll show you exactly why I believe that to be true. But you have the Holy Spirit. We don't have to wait anymore. Now, here's the big problem. Well, here's the question I want to ask you. How engaged are you with the Holy Spirit in your life? Or is the Holy Spirit the ignored person in your life? 
Do we engage with the Spirit? Are we aware of the Spirit? Do we remind ourselves daily of the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life? Or do we ignore Him? So the Spirit's here, so we no longer need to wait. We're not waiting for the Holy Spirit to join us. He's waiting for us to join Him. The Spirit's waiting for us to join Him. The problem is, instead of joining Him, many of us spend our Christian experience ignoring Him. And Paul says when you ignore the Holy Spirit, he calls it grieving the Spirit. He says you're grieving the Spirit. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, reading verse 25 down to 32. Therefore, putting away lying. This is, this, is, this is Paul writing to these believers. He says, putting away lying. Let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we're members of one another. Be angry, don't sin. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Don't give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer. Rather, labor. Work with your hands what is good, that you'll have something to give to them who have in need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what's good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, truth, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Now here's the thing. A lot of people will be sitting here going, that's a good list of evil deeds and wicked sins that you shouldn't do. So if I don't do that, I won't grieve the Spirit. Here's the thing. You're only going to do that stuff if you grieve the Spirit in the first place by ignoring Him. Think about it. Go back and read all that stuff. Do you think the Holy Spirit's cheering us on? Going, evil speaking. Gossip about those people. Yes. Let's do it. All that stuff in there. Here's the thing. Before we ever get the opportunity to step consciously into sin as believers. If you're not a believer here, I'm not speaking to you. But if you're a believer here, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, before you ever stepped into the action of the sin, you, you made a decision already to ignore something. And that is the Holy Spirit on the inside of you, gently saying, this is not going to be the best thing. This is not the best choice. I probably wouldn't do that. We can get to a point where we dull on that voice, we deaden that voice so badly, that one day we wake up and we stop hearing it again. And then we begin to do all this kind of stuff and just, it's okay. We feel like it's okay. See, I think grieving the Spirit is not so much about the action. We grieved the Spirit before we did the action because we ignored the Spirit. We ignored the Spirit. As soon as we start ignoring the Holy Spirit in our life, when we start ignoring the presence and the promptings of the Holy Spirit, then, then we begin to step into these things that we would call sin. Then we begin to break the rules, whatever terminology you want to use. But it's about learning to listen and acknowledge the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. The truth is that as believers, we grieve the Spirit by ignoring His presence and His promptings. So people who make sin management the central facet of Christianity never actually overcome sin. Have you noticed that? People who make sin management the central facet. There's these two ways of thinking about your Christian faith. One is get a hold of the rules, now live them. Spend every minute of your day focusing in on the rules and managing sin. Problem with people that, that, that think that their Christian faith revolves around sin management, you know what you start doing? You start then trying to manage everybody else's sin as well. That's what happens. Because we know what's right and wrong. Problem is, we generally tend to manage the sins in others that we don't kind of worry about too much in our own lives. Eh? Oh, that's not a big one because I do that one. But, oh, that one, I'm, I'm completely clean of that one. You need to clean your act up. Back to what this girl was saying. Can I be pointing out all this stuff? Can I? Well, hang on a second, hang on a second. When we start living by rule books, guess what? Yeah, maybe you can try to turn your faith into a black and white linear event. But if you start walking in the Spirit and living by the Spirit, all of a sudden, it becomes a little more grey, doesn't it? How many of you believe you can do the right things for the wrong reasons? Yeah. You can, you can pray. Read your Bible. Go to church. Put money in the offering plate. Fast, you can do all these things that look great spiritually, but you can be doing them for the wrong reasons. And if there's anybody here and you're doing that stuff because you think it's going to make God like you more, you're doing it for the wrong reason. You're doing it for the wrong reason. But you're doing the right thing. I'm encouraging you. It's good what you're doing, but you're doing it for the wrong reason. If somebody broke into my house tonight with a gun and, and tried to attack my wife and I dove in between my wife and that gentleman and wrestled him to the floor and took his life... Have I done the wrong thing? Well, yeah, because I don't want to kill anyone, but I do it for the right reasons. Yeah, I'm trying to protect my wife. This Christian faith is just not that black and white. There are a lot of grey areas and a lot of nuances in it. We want it to be grey and white, black and white. We want it to be linear because it would make it so much easier, not only for us, but then it becomes easier for us to judge who's in and who's out. Who's doing right and who's doing wrong. Who's been naughty, who's been nice. Santa Claus, here's your list. Who gets a present, who doesn't? 
But it's not like that. And what I want us to understand this morning is it was never meant to be like that. It was never meant to be like that. This life is not meant to be lived by a black and white rule book. It's meant to be lived by an active, vibrant relationship with God, understanding and believing that we have the very Spirit of God on the inside of us. And that Spirit wants to lead us. That Spirit wants to guide us. Now, that's a whole other thing, talking about leading and how do we hear. And I'm sure there's a lot of questions in your mind. But the, the one thing I want you to think about when you go away today is this. When you woke up this morning, when you came here to church, was there anything in you that acknowledged the presence of the Spirit with you? Or, or, or did you ignore? In the week gone past, have you acknowledged the presence of the Spirit with you? Presence does a, a lot of things. Presence changes things. Presence gives me the ability to not press on that website at 2 o'clock in the morning because I realize I'm actually not alone. Somebody else is watching. Presence helps me not to, to go too far with this or too far with that uh, because I know that I'm not alone, even though I am alone physically, but I know somebody else is there. It's amazing the courage and the strength and the self-control that a presence of another person can give you in life. Amen? Do you acknowledge the presence of the Spirit? And here's the good news to those of you that probably think, well, I'm probably more a sin management person. Well, here's the good news for you. I'll finish with this. Romans chapter 8, verse 13, 14. Back to where we started. Just before Paul says, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Just before that, he says this. For if you live according to the flesh, you'll die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you'll live. How do you manage sin? You don't manage sin by battling in the flesh. He says, you'll die. Because the flesh doesn't want to kill the flesh. Deep down inside, there's something that we like about it. There's something we're comfortable with. He says, if you really, really want to manage your sin, then here's how you do it. If you live according to the flesh, you'll die. But if by the Spirit you put the deeds to death, the deeds of the flesh. How are you going to put to death the deeds of the flesh? By living by the Spirit. Stop focusing on the rules, the regulations, the do's, the don'ts, the right, the wrong, am I in, am I out? Stop focusing on that and start focusing on the fact that Jesus died on a cross for you 2,000 years ago. When you gave your life to him, he sent the promise of his Holy Spirit. You are not an orphan. That spirit is with you. That spirit is sent upon you to empower you. Empower you to break free from sin. Empower you to walk into your future. Empower you to walk into your destiny. Empower you to love people you don't think you can love. Empower you to forgive people you don't think you can forgive. Empower you to bring healing to spaces where you just want to punch someone in the face. That's what the Holy Spirit does. So I want to leave you with that question, leave you with that thought this morning. Do, 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 you, do you ignore the Holy Spirit? Because according to Paul, if we ignore the Holy Spirit's presence in our life, Paul says he calls it grieving. It says in Isaiah 63 that the children of Israel did the same thing. It says they rebelled against God. They grieved his spirit. God was there. He did so many amazing, wonderful things. And they loved him when he did all the wonderful things. But at some point, they turned their back and decided, we're going to do our own thing now. And we're going to ignore the promptings and the presence of God. Let's not be the people that ignore the promptings and the presence of God in our lives. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for this morning, God. Again, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for your presence. Lord, we don't need a goosebump to know you're here. We don't need to fall backwards in a chair to know you're here. We don't need to erupt into fits of laughter to know you're here, although those things are fun. And uh, Lord, I love it when that happens. But God, we know you're here by faith. Lord, we know that you're present with us, God, and we want to thank you this morning for the presence of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we, God, before we walk out of this room, Lord, we want to acknowledge the presence of the Spirit. We want to acknowledge the presence of the Holy Spirit, not only in this place, but in the hearts and the lives of every person in this room that has bowed their knee to Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray as we go from this place this morning, Lord, if we are guilty of grieving your Spirit, we have decided our own path, we've decided our own plans, Lord, we, we want to live by sin management. Lord, if that's us, then I pray, Father, Lord, would you speak to us? Don't let us just move on to the next thing. God, speak to us. God, show us the life that you have to offer us in, in Christ. That life is only found in the Spirit, not found in the flesh, Lord. So God, thank you, God. And I pray as we leave this place today too, God, the next seven days we're going to bump into a whole bunch of people that don't know Jesus. There's a lot of people in our community that have no hope, have no faith in anything, Lord. They don't know that you love them. They don't know that you're there for them. 
And Father, we pray, would you give each of us an opportunity this week in the next seven days, each person in here that calls on the name of Jesus, would you give us a chance? Give us an opportunity to talk to somebody about the goodness of God. Tell them how much you love them and what you've done for them, Father. We ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen.